Local programming on KRWG Public Media made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. This is KRWG Public Media, TV, radio, online, news that matters. Now, across the Mesilla Valley and the borderland, the stories that shape our community. From the KRWG Broadcast Center at New Mexico State University, this is Newsmakers. Thanks for joining us on this special edition of Newsmakers. I'm Fred Martino. The Veterans Legal Services Clinic at Yale Law School is working on a very important case you may have heard about. A Las Cruces man who served in the U.S. Army has been living in Juarez for years after being deported. The Legal Services Clinic has filed an application for naturalization on behalf of my guest today, Ivan Okan. The application is a significant step to bring him home to his family. The Biden administration has indicated that returning deported veterans home is a priority, and Ivan Okan's case will be one of the first tests of this promise. Ivan, thank you so much for being with us and for being willing to tell your story today. Thank you, Fred. Thank you for having me on here. I am very appreciative of, of you being here. And I want to start with uh, a little about you telling me about your time in the military. I know that you served uh, during the Iraq War. Uh, yes, I uh, I served from '97 to 2004, almost seven years. Uh, I deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom in '03 uh, to Jordan. Uh, I mean, I love the military. That, that was like right out of high school. I said, "What? It, that's the only thing I thought about doing: join the military, serve my country." Uh, I loved it. I loved it, man. It's just one of those things, and and. Uh, Believe me, they told me if, if I wanted to go back right now, you want to join the army, I, I would. I would do it again, just if that's what it took. And t tell me why you loved it so much. Well, I mean, it just, uh, when I joined, I, I it, it gave me a purpose in life. Uh, it, it, I mean, I came from a poor family, you know, middle class. My mom had two, three jobs and, and uh, it was my way of, uh, it helped me out to serve the country. It, was, it, it gave me purpose in life. And at the same time, I was able to, to help my mom back out at home and my siblings. Um, but I loved it. It was a great experience. I got to travel everywhere uh, in the service, you know, uh, different deployments, uh, stationed at different places. So it's just an awesome experience. And I guess you mentioned uh, twice in your answer, serving serving the country, that, that that was something important to you, that gave you that purpose. Correct. Tell me about uh, readjusting to life in the United States after your service, when you came came back to the U.S. Uh, well, uh, it, it, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, it was, uh, it was hard to adjust to the civilian life. Once you get out the military, it's like uh, the whole purpose is gone. All you can think is about your military, uh, the military, the buddies that are still serving, uh, your friends that are deployed, it's just everything. Like you wish you could be there again, you know? And, and that's one thing that I was, once I got out, I was gonna wait about a year and if, if things weren't looking too good for me, I was gonna enlist again. I was gonna join to the, mili the military, but uh, uh, things happen and, it, it didn't happen, that didn't happen for me, you know? When you were deported, I understand that it came uh, after an incident where you were charged with a crime. Tell me about that. Correct, I got out the military in uh, 2000 and the end of, uh, I think it was 2004 I got out. Um, and I, like I said, I had trouble readjusting back to with society, you know, it wasn't the same. Uh, I, it was hard to get a job and, and everything. It's just so, uh, and I was battling my own little demons from the service, you know. Uh, so I started drinking, uh, smoking, just just whatever I could do to escape. And then uh, 
sooner or later, I mean, uh, I had a, I started having run-ins with the law, even if those little things that speeding or whatever, not you know. But uh, a year after service, I I did get in trouble with the law, and uh, I ended up uh, catching a federal case, and I was charged with uh, aiding and abetting to a kidnapping, and uh, and a gun charge in 2006. And you served a long time uh, in prison for this. Uh, correct. I, I got uh, 10 years, uh, but I did get out in good conduct release. And uh, after nine years, they released me and uh, I thought I was going home. Uh, I asked all the time, is there any ice holds on me or anything like that? Am I going to get deported? And the counselors, everybody in the federal prison system said, no, you're going home, you're going home. And when I came out, when I was about to walk at the door, they said, hold up, you got an ice hold, ice is going to come pick you up. And that's just what happened. Ice came to pick me up and they took me to an ice hold facility where I found my deportation for about 10 months through my military service. And uh, to no avail, I was deported. In uh, 2015, I was deported. I think 16, no, it was 2016. Yeah, and I, I think deported. 2016, so you've been in Mexico yeah. for quite some time now. I think probably a lot of people hearing this story uh, will be, would be very surprised by this, that you uh, were in prison for nine years, you served your time. Uh, prior to that, you served your country in the military, and you're telling me that you weren't even given warning that this was a possibility that when you got out of prison that there was going to be an attempt to to deport you correct yeah i because usually i would ask around and they said no uh within a year before you come out of prison you'll have ice contact you and telling you that you they're gonna pick you up and all that but nothing happened to the very end when i was about to walk out the door from the federal prison they said oh wait you got a hold I'm just going to pick you up. Well, as I mentioned at the beginning of the program, I understand that a Yale Law School program for veterans is helping you with an application to become a citizen so that you can return to the U.S. Tell me, tell me about that. Oh, yes. Uh, they filed the N-400 for me, which is a uh, citizenship through my military service. Uh, not just military service, but a uh, combat deployment and all that. Uh, and I, prior to to them filing in, I filed myself back when I was in ice holding, and they I passed the the biometrics, the test that they give you, a homeland security that the test they give you for citizenship. I passed all that, but they ended up disqualifying me. They said uh, I could never prove in my life that I had good moral character because of that one incident, that felony. Uh, so they denied my N-400 at that time. Uh, and now uh, laws have changed, everything, I mean, think laws change and now the door opened where I could file the N-400 and I'm not barred from citizenship now. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, there's hope now. Before there wasn't too much hope, but now there is hope that, that I will be coming home. And we should point out, as I understand it, you were eligible to become a citizen while serving in the Army, but uh, you didn't get the help uh, to, to do that. Yeah, and, uh, well, when I first enlisted, the recruiter told me, this is gonna make you a citizen. And I was like, okay. Okay, all right. I just, I mean, I was 18, 19 years old. I was like, yeah, okay. That's not why I did it. I did it to serve my country. And to me, the U.S. was already my country, you know? So that was a plus of citizenship, I guess, you know? <laughs> but um, in 2002, before I deployed and uh, before deployment, uh, I decided, you know what? I'm going to look into my citizenship. I'm going to see what's going on. I'm going to go check my status. And so I started asking my chain of command, you know, uh, how do I become a citizen? How do I verify I'm a citizen? Like, where do I go? And nobody in my chain of command knew where to, where, where to tell me where to go. 
uh, one of my NCOs told me, go speak to the JAG office, you know, the JAG officers, the lawyers and all that on post. And so I went over there and to no avail, they just told me, we don't know anything about that. They couldn't tell me where to go. And I said, you know what? Okay. You know what? I got to get ready for to deploy. I got to make my will. I got to uh, just prepare, you know, uh, we were at that time, we were just uh, pre-deployment already we were getting ready to deploy like in the next month or so so i just kind of said you know what if i survive if i come back for more uh i'll look into it again and uh when i came back i didn't have that opportunity did people who you were serving with know your story that you you only were in mexico as a young child as i understand it that you you were in las cruces at age eight or seven or eight right yeah i was age seven age seven yes. so i mean the u.s is home i mean i'm i'm guessing that uh you know i think back to when i was uh six or seven i i don't remember hardly anything from, the, from <laughs> right. that long ago uh i can't imagine the situation you 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 were in, how you felt, what was happening, how you managed, take me back to 2016 when oh. you thought, you know, you're getting out of prison, you can start your life over, and instead you're sent to another country. It's not your home anymore. You know, it's the it's not the U.S. It's it's Mexico. Oh man, it's 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 the it's the worst feeling ever. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, um, it, it's especially when, when uh, the final hearing for my immigration case, the district attorney, the district attorney for Homeland Security, he uh, when my lawyer and then passed on my my military record, my service record. Uh, he said he just pushed it to the side, didn't even look at it. He said the service doesn't matter to this country. Good luck in Mexico. Um, that that's that's one of those. Uh, that's the worst feeling ever, right there. That's for sure. Um, <clears throat> especially uh, while my time in service, I was a great soldier. You know what I mean? I I volunteered for everything. I did a lot of. I gave it all. You know, you lose all your youth to the military. Um, I got numerous awards, always won competitions, inspections. I was a great soldier. Uh, I was an NCO. I had uh, soldiers under me. Um, so yeah, it's, it's awful. It's, it's like, like they just ripped your heart out. You know what I mean? I was ready to die for the country and, <clears throat> and then this happened. So yeah, it's. It's awful feeling. I don't wish it upon nobody. I understand that you're not alone, that you live in Juarez with other deported veterans in a support house. This is when I first read your story uh, quite some time ago. I read about this. Tell me about that. Yes, when I first got deported in, uh, in uh, 2016, I mean, I, I came to Juarez, nowhere to go. Uh, didn't know anybody, you know what I mean? Uh, I have family down here, but at the same time, I've been gone so long, it's, you don't really know them, you know? And in this situation, the only ones that you only can associate with people that are going through the same thing. So I isolated myself from the family I did have down here. Um, you become very suicidal the first couple of months because you they tell you you can never come back to the United States. The only way is that, uh, is in a body bag so sometimes you think that's the best option you know like just whatever i want to go home no matter what um <clears throat> but yeah so um, so i was deported like already for six months and i started just uh, just googling deported veterans and stuff like that and and it led me to a site for a uh, deported veteran support house uh tijuana and i contacted hector barajas right away and i told me hey, i'm I'm deported. I'm down here in Juarez. Is there any assistance for deported veterans down here? And uh, he told me no, but there is a group of veterans down in Juarez. And uh, I started reaching out to them. And before we know it, we started uh, with the help of, of course, uh, Hector Barajas. Uh, 
we started the uh, deported veterans support house Juarez and uh first we started with like five veterans from there we started growing we start uh, like my job what i do is help veterans uh, file their va claims uh seek their benefits and often i do uh fundraisers uh we take donations and I distribute it to, to the to the other deported veterans in need. Has that helped you uh, having that support of other uh, men that are in your shoes? Well, yeah, so it's helped a lot, you know. Uh, you still have that, that brotherhood that exists between veterans. So, and then we're all going through the same theme, the same battle, so, uh, it's we still have that brotherhood that uh you know uh it just feels like like i'm back at home in the state sometimes with my brothers you know we're we we're all going through the same battle we live, we're living the same life uh and that's my motivation uh i became one of the advocates here for deported veterans uh i've done numerous interviews uh documentaries everything and uh i i the way I see it, if I can't come home myself, I will help others to come home. Are there others uh, who are in the home there who are getting help like you from some sort of legal services clinic uh, like the Yale Law School one that is helping you? At this moment, no, there isn't. A, what happened is that a few, a few, like two years ago, we made a connections with the union, AFL-CIO, and through them, uh, I was lucky. They they picked my case out of a handful to to uh, help me and bring me home. So there is other veterans that are probably in the process as well. Um, I know there's one more that they are helping. I think she's a uh, Laura Mesa from Costa Rica. They're trying to help her out too as well right now at this time, uh, but there's, once we open this door, uh, we might be able to help other veterans to come back too as well, you know? It, it just, it's gonna be one-on-one -on -one basis, basically. We can't bring everybody back at the same time, but we're, we're gonna continue to fight to bring as many brothers back home as possible. And I know if you, do come home you have a strong connection to this region with relatives and a daughter in the u.s that you can't even visit right now correct i have a 18 year old daughter the last time i saw her she was three years old uh, i mean i talked to her on the phone uh, facebook and all that but it's not the same as basically being there and being able to hug her and and you missed all the years of her life and then you just still can't be there, you know, so it's kind of it's kind of tough. And that's the only reason I keep on fighting to come back to home to my daughter. You know, that's that's my stepping stone right there. Without her, I probably wouldn't even be here right now. Yeah. As I mentioned uh, earlier, you came to Las Cruces when you were seven years old. Um, had, was there any any help from the fact that the first a uh, few years of your life you were in Juarez as a, as a child. Has that helped at all? Um, not really. <laughs> no. But I guess you knew Spanish, right? Uh, they, they put it this way. They call me gringo down here. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I know Spanish enough to get me by, but I'm not like fluent like when I was a little boy no more. You know, I've been too much in the state, so I, I kind of lost that uh, the Spanish, so now I'm a gringo down here. Yeah, yeah. Well, growing up in Las Cruces, I understand that you graduated from the former uh, Oñante High School, now Oregon Mountain uh, High. Oh. <laughs> tell, tell me about growing up here, what it was like growing up in, in Las Cruces before you served your country in the U.S. Army. Wow, well, I mean, my childhood, um, I had a good childhood growing up, you know, uh, school, I love school, you know, uh, I tried to give my best. It, it was hard at first because, of course, I didn't know English that much, but along the years, as a little boy, I started picking up more English and everything, so uh, 
yeah, you made you meet a lot of friends, a lot of good people, uh, and that's what drove me to one of the things that drove me to to join the military as well because I had a lot of friends growing up that were graduating at the same time, and uh, we had talked about it. What are you guys gonna do? Oh, I'm gonna join the military. So it was one of those things like, you know what? I'm gonna join the military military too. I'm gonna serve my country and die for my country if I have to. That was you know. That's what you think when you're 18, you know? You just give it all. Uh, but I, I mean, I had a good childhood. My mom, she, I didn't grow up without, I grew up, I didn't grow up without a father figure. So my mom was that, that role model. And uh, she, like I said, she worked two, three jobs. And, and as, as soon as I graduated, I said, you know what? I'm gonna join the military. I, I can't afford to go to college or anything like that, but the military, uh, I'll be all right. Um, and I was able to assist my family through, through that, you know. You mentioned your daughter, other, tell me about other family members that are still, uh, you have contact with in, in the U.S. Well, I mean, I have my, my mom's over there. I have my, uh, three brothers and a sister and uh, also my daughter, you know, that's. I was the one that used to keep the family together. And now that I'm, I'm not there, it's like everybody's just scattered in the wind. <laughs> and your mom is, is your mom in Las Cruces? Yes, yeah, she's in Las Cruces. Uh, she, she comes to visit at least once a month down here in Juarez. Um, it, it's just hard, you know, the, the lines to go back sometimes two, three hours or whatever. So you gotta pick the right days to come visit, but uh, I told them I'll be fine. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm always busy advocating or whatever I'm doing. So uh, I just try to stay busy and then focused on, on the mission ahead of me, you know, just keep on advocating for, for brothers and make sure they get their benefits. And we don't know how long we're going to be down here. So uh, as much as I can help them, I try to help everybody down here. Uh, seeing uh this, I, I'm sure a lot of people um, will gain a lot of knowledge. This, this certainly was something I uh, learned about through media coverage uh, before setting up this conversation uh, with you. And I hope that uh, one day that, that I'll be able to uh, talk with you in person in, in the U.S. For people who are watching this, uh, Ivan, whether they're in Las Cruces or not, because people watch all over the world uh, online, what is the message that you want them to have uh, about this situation? Well, I mean, that, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I already know the way people are right away. They're, they, they see the, they should have followed the law. They broke the law. Oh, well, you know, they don't, but it takes a lot to, to serve your country and be willing to die for it, you know? And yes, we suffer from PTSD as well and other, <clears throat> other ailments from the, from serving, you know, and we deserve that, that same equal opportunity and treatment, you know, uh, it, it's hard to get health, good healthcare down here. Um, but my message is, you know, uh, the, the the U.S. is built on on second chances and everything else, and one mistake that we did many years ago shouldn't shouldn't uh, shouldn't uh, I can't I'm, I'm lost for words I'm 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 really emotional right now. <laughs> um, I, I I let let's end on a ho a hopeful note. I know what you're saying. Second chances, forgiveness a chance to come home after years of serving your country and then serving a, a very long sentence uh, in prison, serving the time that you, you were given. Uh, what are your dreams for the future? Should your case be accepted and you get to come back home to Las Cruces? Well, I mean, I don't, I don't dream that far ahead. My first thing is just my, the nearest dream is hopefully I get to come home and see my daughter, hug my daughter. But like I said, uh, I'm st I'm gonna continue to come back to Waters because I, we have a lot of veterans still deported, and 
and somebody has to help them out still regardless and that's my mission to help brothers out and and help my community back at home veterans back at home uh and here as well you know and just because i get to go back doesn't mean i'm gonna leave my brothers behind everybody thinks that i i'm gonna leave and that's it <laughs> but no like i tell them i'm gonna be here uh, even if i'm over there or here i'm still gonna be helping them the ones that are stuck here in what in mexico still and deported you know so if your case is successful uh this would be your new service that you would you would think about is helping serve those who were in your same situation correct um as well i'm part of a joint military assistance command which is a Nonprofit organization made up of veterans in the United States, and they actually uh, provide a service to the VA for honor guard, funeral detail, uh, assistance to veterans that are transitioned, just coming out the military. Uh, we have service dogs uh, for PTSD. We have uh, we just offer all this assistance for veterans, victims of rape or whatever, not you know and. Uh, and right now we're doing a first aid training and we also do volunteer firefighting. So I'm gonna, hopefully when I come back, I'm gonna take a bigger role in that. Well, we wish you the very best. And again, thank you so much for sharing your story. I know this is not easy. It's very emotional. And we appreciate you uh, educating folks about this situation and that you're not alone. Thank you, Ivan. Thank you. That is our time for now. Join us this week on KRWG Radio. Every weekday, it's Morning Edition from 5 to 9, fresh air at 11, followed by Here and Now, noon to 2, and All Things Considered, 4 to 7. KRWG News is always online at krwg.org, and we would love to hear from you. Email us with your story ideas and video submissions. The address is feedback at nmsu.edu. For all of us at KRWG News, I'm Fred Martino. Have a great week. We will see you next time on Newsmakers.